Well, I want to welcome you to a new series that we're beginning today. And this is unlike anything I've ever done. This is going to be not so much me teaching you, not so much me lecturing you, so much sharing insights with you, maybe, maybe some of that. I, I, I'm sure there will be some of that. But this is really, this series that we call Enrich is focused upon a devotional life of a Christian. You know, pursuing a deeper, more committed relationship with God is what it's really all about for us. You know, our, our quest in this world is not simply to be more knowledgeable, although that's important. I believe, you know, in studying the Bible, I was privileged to be raised in a Christian home and to be a part of a Christian school for 12 years and then to undergraduate and graduate school. So I've had a lot of formal training in the Bible. I certainly have prepared many, many sermons and messages over the 50 years that I've been preaching. I've written class material. I have presented classes. I have recorded things even most recently, of course. And there's no limit to the learning that we can get. And all of that is very, very important. I don't want to minimize that at all. But some of the best stuff that I've ever done is a personal relationship in a personal relationship with God is simply to get up early and spend time with God is to put on some coffee to go in my office grab my journal and start looking at God's word and just simply trying to understand it try to open my heart and my ears to listen to know God better and I've done my best to do that. I've done it for many years. Probably the most serious study I did was on the mind of Christ. It took me seven years and 21 journals and took me deeply into his mind. Why? Why would I do that? Well, there's really a couple of reasons. One is because I want to know Christ. But the second is, is because I want to leave a legacy for my children and my grandchildren. I want to leave behind something that they can read and they can kind of know how I spent my life. But this quest for a deeper relationship with God. You know, I've seen many kinds of Christians during my 50 years. And I myself have been up and down all over the place sometimes when it comes to my relationship with God. Because, you know, we struggle, with our, us preachers struggle just like everybody else does. You So just knowing more stuff doesn't make you more spiritual. It can help, but it doesn't necessarily make you more spiritual. So I've had to devote myself to that, and I, I'm still learning. There's a lot of things that are written on this subject. There's a lot of uh, people who lived a long, long time ago who wrote about their quest to know God better, and some of them are, some of the things they've written, I've read, and they're very challenging things. But certain people have taken vows of poverty or gone and lived in the desert or they've done extreme things just to separate themselves from this world and to spend time with God and that's certainly one of the challenges that we have is living in this world and having so many distractions and making time just to be alone with God to be quiet and I, I would tell you if you're going to get the most out of this series that we're going to do if you're if you're willing to spend some time with me every every week then find a quiet place don't just do this just to be doing it. Find a quiet place, open your Bible, become, get in a prayerful mood, and 
dedicate yourself to what we'll be talking about in regard to knowing God. We'll be talking about prayer. We'll be talking about any number of subjects that bring us closer to, to our Father. I want to lead us in a prayer as we get started this morning, and then I'll define a little bit more what we're talking about. Our Father God, we come to you. Father, I want to recognize you as the great creator of the universe, the one that is so wonderful, so magnificent. Father, I magnify your name. I glorify you. I lift you up as my God and my Father. I, I acknowledge, Father, that you in many ways are mysterious, but I also acknowledge that you are the one that lives right within my heart. Father, I recognize my dependence upon you. Father, I know that I could not take my next breath without you. I could not live and move and have my very being without you. Father, you are a, a wise and just a powerful, a powerful God. Father, us human beings struggle with knowing anybody, even knowing ourselves and knowing other people, even those, those that are close to us. And we definitely, Father, struggle with knowing you. Even though you've gone to such great links to reveal yourself to us. Father, you have revealed yourself in your word. You've revealed yourself in nature. You've even revealed yourself deeply within our hearts. You have created us in your image. You've given us the ability, Father, to know you, to understand you because we are like you already. We are able to love and to have faith and we're able to be kind and good. We're able to do all those things, Father, because you made us like you. Father, give us this heart, this desire, this strong desire to know you, to experience you in our lives, to have such a close connection with you, Father, that you are the most vital and personal relationship that we could ever enjoy. God, help us to major in this. Help us to set aside time every day to commune with you, to talk with you, to listen to you, to understand you. Father, you understand us through and through. And sometimes that scares us because we know, Father, that there's nothing that we can hide from you. Father, I don't want to hide anything from you. I want to know you even as I am known. And Father, I pray for this devotional series that we're going to be embarking on today and over the next several weeks that you will help me, Father. I, I feel so inadequate to lead people into a deeper relationship with you like this. I, I just, I know it's hard for me. It's just hard for me, Father. But I feel it's so important. So, Father, help each one that's listening to this right now, wherever they are, that, Father, their hearts will be open, that they will submit themselves totally to you, and that, Father, they will wait in expectation for what you are going to reveal to us in this series. Father, surprise us. Come close to us. Help us, Father, to know you're right here with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I think about knowing God, I can't help but think about the other side of that coin, about how much he knows us. I thought I'd read a little bit from Psalm 139 just to kind of prepare us for this new intimacy that we're, we're searching for in this series. Psalm 139, David says, You have searched me, 
Search me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, O oh, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. How do we even imagine how close God is to us? You know, I'm sitting here in this empty auditorium right now just talking and recording this. And I think about all the time I've spent in this room. I think about the times that I have prayed and I have sang songs to God and I have preached the gospel, taken the Lord's Supper, and all the while imagining God being right here in, in, in this room. This room has been filled with hundreds of people over the 27 years that I've been here. And I think about all, each one of them and their unique relationship with God the Father. And about how he's been right here. Father, and, I, and, I, and I understand a little bit about how that before I even said a word, God knew what that word was going to be. How he laid his hand upon me. You know, such knowledge, he says here, is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. He goes on to say, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Why would I want to? Why would I want to be out of the presence of God? Why would I not always be running towards God? What is it in us that sometimes runs away from God? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Where could I go? Even if I wanted to, where could I hide from God? Remember one time Elijah ran away to hide in a cave. God found him. There have been many people who have tried to hide from God. And Jonah, he ran away, ended up in a fish. God found him. Where are you going to go? Why would you want to? Jesus asked his disciples one time as he saw the crowds leaving him and going away in John chapter 6. And he said, do you want to go away too? And Peter said, where would we get, where, where, where we go? You have the words of eternal life. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I don't even know what that means. I mean, I'm, I don't know how many more days I have on this earth. I know I have a lot fewer days ahead of me than I have behind me. But God already knows all those days, all those hours, all those minutes. How do I even imagine someone who knows me so well? And yet, sometimes I feel like I don't even know who God is. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. 
If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. But even when I think about people who don't care anything about God, who are enemies of God, who don't acknowledge him, who don't seem to want to know him, and then I look at me and I say, well, how badly do I want to know him? How intimate am I with him? I'm not, I'm not his enemy, but am I his friend? Am I that person who wants beyond anything else? The highest goal and the aim that I have is to know God. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, as we think about coming into the presence of God and knowing him, how do we do that? How do we do that without first acknowledging our own sin and, and, the, and the need for us to repent of those sins for God to first search me and to see if there's any offensive way in me. And if, I find, if he finds something and I know he's found something offensive in me, how can I come into his presence unless I first repent of my sins? And I seek him in holiness and righteousness. That's why it's so important. If I'm going to know God, I've got to know him through Jesus because he's the one who makes me righteous and he's the one who makes me holy. Let's pray. Father God, we want to know you, but we know you're a holy God. We know you're righteous. We're so grateful that Jesus Christ came and died upon the cross so that we could be holy and righteous. So we could be blameless before you. So Father, we could enter into your presence and we can get to know you. Father, search us right now. If you find any offensive way in us, help us to leave it here right now before you in repentance and in commitment to live differently. Thank you, Father, for showing us what we need to see inside of ourselves so that we can have that intimacy with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I think of knowing God, one of the books that probably is the most popular one on the subject is a book called Knowing God. It's written by J.I. Packer. Packer was a great student of the Bible. He wrote a very wonderful book in order to help us know God better. And um, I thought today I would read just a little bit from that book because I want to expose you to some of the writings that have made a difference in my life and this is one of the books that have. Page 17 and 18, this is in chapter 1. It's called The Study of God. That's really what theology is. It means the study of God. Listen to what he says. I may make a few comments as we go through this a little bit, but listen to what Packer writes here. On January the 7th, 1855, a minister of New Park Street Chapel, Southwark, England, opened his morning sermon as follows. It has been said by someone that the proper study of mankind is man. I will not oppose the idea, but I believe it is equally true that the proper study of God's elect is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of a child of God, is the nature, is the name, is the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his Father. What this man, this preacher is saying is, if you want to know yourself, 
you first must know God. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all of our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can compass and grapple with, in them we feel a kind of self-content and go our way with the thought, Behold, I am wise. But when we come to this matter, or when we come to this master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound this depth, and that our eagle eye cannot see us height, we turn away with the thought that vain man would be wise, but he is like a wild ass's colt with solemn exclamation, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. No subject of contemplation will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. You want to be humbled? Contemplate God. Think about God. Try to plunge into the depths of the mind of God and you will be humbled. But while the subject humbles the mind, and it also expands it. He who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around this narrow globe. The most excellent study for expanding the soul is the science of Christ and Him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead in the glorious Trinity. Nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. Do you want to expand your mind? You're not going to do it by simply studying earthly things. Nothing will expand your mind more than trying to understand God. The preacher goes on to say, and whilst humbling and expanding, this subject is eminently consolatory. Oh, there is, in contemplating Christ, a balm for every womb. In musing on the Father, there is a quietus for every grief. And in the influence of the Holy Spirit, there is a balsam for every sore. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go, plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in His immensity, and you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm, and calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead it is to that subject that I invite you this morning, the preacher said. In other words, if you would find peace and comfort and strength in this present world, there's nothing you can do better than to contemplate God. Packer concludes this by saying these words spoken over a century ago by C.H. Spurgeon at the time, incredibly, he was only 20 years old, were true then and they are true now. They make a fitting preface to a series of studies on the nature and the character of God. I thought that was a good way to kind of begin the study that we have here. I want to share with you something a few pages over on page 23. I want you to listen carefully to this because this, is a, this whole subject today is about knowing God and about our having a desire to do so. Packer says our aim in studying the Godhead must be to know God himself better. Our concern must be to enlarge our acquaintance, not simply with the doctrine of God's attributes, but with the living God whose attributes they are. As he is the subject of our study, 
and our helper in it, so he must himself be the end of it. We must seek in studying God to be led to God. It was for this purpose that revelation was given, and it is to this use that we must put it. In other words, as I said before, this is not simply an academic study just to simply know more about God, to list all of his attributes, to maybe even study of the various names of God in the Bible. This is a study about getting to know God. This is what Enrich is all about, to bring us into a fuller and deeper relationship with God. He goes on to write this, meditating on the truth. How are we to do this? How can we turn our knowledge about God into knowledge of God? The rule for doing this is simple but demanding. It is that we turn each truth that we learn about God into matter for meditation before God, leading to prayer and praise to God. What is he saying simply? How do we go from knowing about God to actually knowing God? It's going to be through meditation. It's going to be to take some truth about God and to really contemplate it. To really turn it over and look at it very carefully. We have some idea, perhaps, what prayer is, but what is meditation? Well, may we ask, for meditation is a lost art today, and Christian people suffer grievously from their ignorance of his practice. Meditation is the activity of calling to mind and thinking over and dwelling on and applying to oneself the various things that one knows about the works and ways and purposes and promises of God. I want to read that again. You want a definition of meditation? Packer gives you that definition. Meditation is the activity of calling to mind and thinking over and dwelling on and applying to oneself the various things that one knows about the works and the ways and purposes and promises of God. It is an activity of holy thought consciously performed in the presence of God, under the eye of God, by the help of God, as a means of communion with God. Learning to meditate upon the truths that are given within God's Word, or the truths that we, found that we find in nature, or even the truths we find even in our own heart, being able to meditate and think about those things will bring you into a closer relationship with God and a better knowledge of God himself. The contemplative life is the best life. It's the best life. Its purpose is to clear one's mental and spiritual vision of God and to let his truth make his full and proper impact on one's mind and heart. In other words, if we're going to allow God to impact our lives, if we're going to experience Him, we have to clear some things away. We have to get rid of some distractions and the things in our hearts that just simply will not allow God to get close to us. It is a matter of talking to oneself about God and oneself. It is indeed often a matter of arguing with oneself, reasoning oneself out of moods of doubt and unbelief into a clear apprehension of God's power and grace. Its effect is ever to humble us as we contemplate God's greatness and glory and our own littleness and sinfulness and to encourage and reassure us, comfort us, in the old strong Bible sense of the word, as we contemplate the unsearchable riches of divine mercy displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The more I understand how unsearchable are the riches of the mercy it's of Christ, how more comforting it is to me to know how much he loves me. 
These were the points stressed by Spurgeon in the passage which we quoted at the beginning, and they are true. And it is as we enter more and more deeply into this experience of being humbled and exalted that our knowledge of God increases, and with it our peace, our strength, and our joy. God help us to put our knowledge about God to this use, that we may all in truth know the Lord. You know, I find people who are espousing the notion of being Christian, of talking a lot about the salvation that they enjoy in Christ. I find them talking a lot about the comfort that they have in knowing that they'll be saved. I find them having a, a blessed assurance. And all of that is so wonderful. But one, time, one thing sometimes is missing in that is, is that they acknowledge that because they're in Christ and because that they have surrendered their lives to Christ and because they have been baptized into Christ, sometimes the thing that's lacking is that deep personal relationship with Him, with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. You know, I remember many years ago coming to understand this passage and it's been uh, one of the wonderful major truths of, of my life that and when I when I grasped this idea I want to read it to you it's in Jesus's prayer in John chapter 17 it says in verse 1 after Jesus said this he looked toward heaven and he prayed father the hour has come Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Isn't it a wonderful thought to know that Jesus wants to give you and I eternal life? I know I used to think of eternal life simply from the standpoint of a life that never ends. Everlasting life. Eternal life is the life that goes on and on and on. And I believe it does. That is the nature of eternal life. But yet, eternal life is more than quantity of life. Eternal life is quality of life. You know, Jesus said he came to give us life and to give it abundantly. That full and abundant life is the quality of life that we seek. But what's the essence of that life? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 3. He says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Did you hear what he said? The essence of eternal life is to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowing God is eternal life. Knowing Jesus is eternal life. And again, it's the quality of life that we enjoy. You know, we, we seek quality of life down here. We're, we, we seem to be constantly looking for that something that's going to satisfy us. And I'm going to tell you, where you're going to find it, it's going to be in those quiet moments when you are alone with God and you through prayer and reading and meditation, and contemplation and humbling yourself, that's where you're going to find the quality of life that you're looking for. Do you want to know God? You know, I think sometimes we, we try to convince people they ought to come to church. 
We try to convince people that they ought to read their Bible. We try to convince people that they should pray more. We try to convince people that they should be good and live a holy life. But why? What's the point? I think the highest calling of man is to know the one who created him. God created you and me. He is our creator. He is our, he is, he's the one who shaped us. He molded us. And when we die, we're going to return to him and we're going to see him. But are we going to know him? Yeah, I guess I could say all of life can be boiled down to one thing. Do you know God? And do you know his son? Well, in this series, we're going to try to get to know the father and the son in various ways. But today, after I'm gone, after this is over, after you turn this off, would you get down on your knees? Will you bow your head? Would you fall down on your face? Would you implore God and say, God, I want to know you. Help me know you. If this series will accomplish that, then it would be my prayer. That is good enough. Let's pray. Father God, Father God, will you let us know you? Will you let us come into your presence? Will you invite us to your table? Will you take us under the shelter of your wing? Will you let us, Father, sit upon your lap, look up in your, into your face, to hear your soothing and comforting words, to feel your loving embrace, to imagine, Father, what it's going to be like for an eternity of knowing you more and more and more. Father, each one of us want to know you. Help us to commit ourselves to spending time daily in your word. Help us to stay alert when we're walking around and we see the things that you've made. Help us not to miss it. Help us not to miss you. Father, train us to see you in everything and in everybody because your presence is everywhere. Father, I think that's what it means when you, to say that you're omnipresent. It means that you are everywhere, that you, Father, can be known in more ways than we've ever imagined. Father, I pray for those who will be listening to this series. I pray that something will be said that will touch their heart. That will ignite a desire within their souls to seek you more perfectly every day. Help me, Father, to find ways to do that. 
Father, teach us to meditate. Teach us, Father, to be disciplined enough to enjoy the quiet. Help us, Father, not to be intimidated by the quietness. Help us, Father, to enjoy solitude because you are in the solitude. Help us to be quiet enough, Father, to hear that you're still small voice and through all of this Father please enrich our lives I pray to you in the name of Jesus Christ Amen Well God bless you I look forward to being with you again next week as we pursue this deeper and deeper relationship with God. God bless.